Part 3 and Part 4. Now look at Part 1. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a woman and a policeman. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, Sergeant Rhodes speaking. Can I help you? Yes, hello. I'd like to report a stolen bag. Hmm, OK, a stolen bag. Uh, we've been getting a lot of these lately. I'll need to get some details. Uh, let's see, uh, when was the last time you had your bag? Well, uh, about two hours ago. I just can't believe this has happened. I take it everywhere with me. It was given to me as a graduation present. I'm just so upset. Yes, I know. Uh, it's very frustrating. It seems like I put it down for a second, and then it was gone. Yes. Look, the good news is that most of the stolen bags in our area are found, usually without the money. So I'd be surprised if you don't get it back later. Tell me, what does the bag look like? Well, it's dark blue, cylindrical. It has two carry handles either side of a zipper on top. Um, the zipper actually runs the length of the bag. It's a Vitoli bag. OK. Are there any other identifying marks on the bag? Things that would be unique to it. Um, name tags, scuff marks, that kind of thing. Well, not really. Um, there are a couple of scratches in the top left corner on one side of the bag near the handle and I think another one in the opposite corner. Okay. Uh, scratches on opposite corners. Now, where were you when the bag went missing? Well, I remember the time. It was a quarter past twelve. Oh, no, actually, it was a bit after that, more like 12.25, because I was supposed to meet one of my friends for lunch at 12.30. Anyway, I was standing outside the supermarket when all of a sudden a group of teenagers came walking past. They must have been heading towards the cinema. They seemed to be in a hurry and probably late for the movie, so I stepped aside to let them by. When they'd passed by, I reached down to pick up my bag, and it was gone. I see. Now, can you remember the contents of the bag? Yes. Um, let's see, my passport and some traveler's checks. Fortunately, I was carrying my camera and I had my wallet in my pocket. They're the main valuable things. Um, okay. Uh, anything else at all? Hmm, let's see. No, I think that was it. Oh, a few pens, but that's all really. As I say, nothing of real value. Okay. I'm going to have to get your details. Are you here on holiday? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm visiting from Canada. I've been here for three weeks already, but I'll be here for another month. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, uh, have you contacted your credit card company? Yes, I did that immediately. They were very helpful. I still can't believe this could happen to me, and while I'm supposed to be enjoying myself on holiday. Yes, it's a real disappointment, whether you're on holiday or not. A thieves strike when you least expect it. Anyway, I need to take down your particulars. Um, what's your name then? Yes, uh, my name is Helen Reddy. That's R-E-A-D-Y. My address is, well, the place where I'm staying here is The Palms, Unit 1475 Paradise Avenue. OK, I may need your home address in Canada, but I'll get that more towards the time you're going to leave. Uh, what about the telephone? 
What number will I be able to reach you on? Yes, it's four double five nine one double three two. Okay, uh, four double five nine one double three two. And how much do you think the bag and contents are worth? Well, it's not really a big cost, probably only a hundred dollars. It's the inconvenience of it all. I understand. Look, we have a lot of lost or stolen property recovered daily. Come by the station tomorrow and have a look. As I said, there's a high chance that we'll get the bag back. Your passport, at the very least. Okay. Thanks for your help. See you tomorrow then. Bye. Yes. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a recorded message giving information about an animal park. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the first part of the message and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to the Australian Wildlife Park Information Line. The Australian Wildlife Park is very proudly owned and operated by an Australian family, John and Amanda Brooks, who operate the Australian Wildlife Park with their children, David and Sandra. The family doesn't receive any government assistance. It's solely funded by tourists visiting the park. Thank you for your support and assistance. When the Brooks family purchased the Australian Wildlife Park in 1987, the park housed a small collection of animals and birds on a modest five acre or two hectare property. A few years later, the park doubled in size when the family purchased the adjoining property. Also, the collection of animals started to boom. In May 2003, the family designed and built a new park in the public open space. Once again, more than doubling in size. The park now features about 200 species with more than 2,000 head of animals, birds and reptiles. Regarding the entry fee, adults pay $23, children aged 3 to 14 pay $10, age pensioners are $17 and students are $16. One of the great things about the Australian Wildlife Park is that all of the attractions are included in the entry fee. No extra money is needed around the park, so make the most of your experience. All shows, talks, photo opportunities and animal food are included in your entry fee. In addition, the Australian Wildlife Park is open every day of the year from 9am to 5.30pm, except Christmas Day, 25th of December. Before the final part of the message, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 16 to 20. Now answer questions 16 to 20. Several attractions are available to visitors to the Australian Wildlife Park. Firstly, you can meet the koalas between 10am and 4.30pm. Here, people can view the koala colony in a natural environment. Another attraction is to feed the kangaroos between 9am and 5.30pm. Visitors can take a walk through the kangaroo enclosure, viewing them in a natural environment. Kangaroo food is provided and the kangaroos are very friendly. Also enjoyable are the wombats at 11am, 
2 p.m. and 3.45 p.m., there are interactive shows where the team is delighted to introduce you to these popular animals. Other attractions that may interest you are an interactive farmyard, suitable for children of all ages. Animal food is provided and the animals are very friendly. In addition, the working farm is where the country comes to town. Visitors can milk a cow, bottle feed a lamb, watch farm dogs gathering the sheep. All the excitement of a real Australian farm. When they ask for volunteers, be sure to put your hand up. Everyone can get involved. We at the Australian Wildlife Park hope all our visitors have an enjoyable time. See you soon. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students, called Richard and Shirley, discussing the information they have collected so far for a group project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi Shirley, glad you could meet me at the weekend to talk about the research we have to do on energy. Yes Richard, I think it's important that we stay focused on the specific area of our research, energy consumption. Did you know that the demand for electricity is growing faster than coal, oil and gas can supply it? Yes indeed. Coal and oil, which I discovered are also known as fossil fuels, could have disastrous effects on world climate. My research supports you. I also found out that the weather could be affected by global warming. However, a range of fuels are used around the world. Did you know that the most common fuels are the fossil fuels, with oil accounting for almost half at 45%? Coal and natural gas are equal next at 20% with nuclear power being the lowest at 7%. Other sources of energy are also near the bottom at 8%. Before the final part of the conversation, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 27 to 30. Now answer questions 27 to 30. That information will be useful when we look at the different energy sources in detail. We also need to look at the pros and cons of each type of energy. We've already said that fossil fuels increase the world's temperature, but we also need to mention the most serious issue, that these three types of fuel are finite, meaning they will not last forever. Another major disadvantage is that by burning coal and oil in particular, chemicals are released into the atmosphere which combine with water to fall back to earth and damage both plant and animal life. That really sounds useful. If you focus on coal, oil and gas, I'll look into nuclear power. It is common knowledge that nuclear power stations create radioactive waste, but I'm particularly interested in how this unwanted waste product is dealt with safely. I'll also need to look at the effects on people living near these power stations. Yes, I think all those areas need exploring. Do you think I should also look into renewable energy sources, such as wind and sun, energy that never runs out? Don't you think it's an important area to consider? Yes, 
but I don't think I'll have enough time to look at it in enough detail. I also agree that we have enough to focus on until our next group meeting. So to finish, you could find some information on the advantages of fossil fuels and I'll give you the facts that I have already on coal, oil and gas. We don't need to look into other energy sources because I'll get more details on the nuclear industry. That's great. See you in two weeks' time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture on art history. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In the last lectures, we looked at the art of the ancient Egyptians and then considered the art of other ancient Mediterranean civilizations, in particular Greece and Rome. We're now going to return to Egypt to consider a set of very unusual pictures known as the Fayum portraits. The Fayum is a lush green area about 100 kilometers west of Cairo. Following the conquest of Egypt by the Greek warrior Alexander the Great in 332 BC, large numbers of businessmen and officials who had come over from Greece settled in this fertile region with their families. They gradually adopted some features of Egyptian culture, including the practice of mummification, embalming the bodies of their dead and wrapping them in linen bandages in order to preserve them as mummies. The name actually comes from an Arabic word meaning an embalmed body. These newcomers made one distinctive innovation, though. After binding the mummy, they laid over the face a picture representing the person inside. The portraits look like oil on canvas, but they were actually produced using a technique called encaustic, where the artist applies pigmented wax to a wooden board with a small spatula. The Egyptologist William Petrie, who discovered many of these mummies with their accompanying portraits at the end of the 19th century, was convinced that they were actually done in the lifetime of the subject, rather than being painted after the person's death, as had been the case with older Egyptian paintings. He felt they were very different from the traditional stylized images that had been used on Egyptian mummy casings in previous centuries, and was convinced that they were actually portraits giving a realistic depiction of the person. He pointed out that the boards on which they were painted showed signs of having been cut down to size to fit within the mummy bandages. To him, this suggested that they may have originally been larger and been hung in the houses of the owners during their lifetimes. But more than a century after they came to light, nobody knew how far they were really depictions of real people, as against idealised portraits. Then a team from Manchester University decided to find out, by recreating the faces of Fayum mummies in clay, and then comparing the reconstructions with the portraits. 
The team was provided with skulls from two Fayoum mummies from the British Museum, and given the information, based on x-rays and other evidence, that one of the mummies was of a fifty-year-old man, and the other was a woman in her early twenties. Armed only with this information, they set to work. First, they created copies of the skulls. Then they used clay to build up the facial muscles in order to reconstruct what the person looked like. After weeks of painstaking labor, two faces emerged. Only then were the two portraits revealed so that the match between the reconstructions and the portraits could be examined. In the case of the man, both model and portrait showed a broad, flat face with a slightly hooked nose and a fleshy mouth with broad lips. But the man in the portrait was noticeable for his five o'clock shadow, the beard beginning to grow around his chin and on his cheeks. This would have been quite a recognizable feature of the man in real life, and an easy thing for the painter to copy. However, it wasn't something that the makers of the model could know about. In the reconstruction, the right eye was slightly higher than the left, and this was the same on the portrait. But on the portrait, the eyes were very large, which is standard with many of the Fayoum portraits. While in the model, they were longer and narrower. The portrait of the woman appeared to be even more of a standard type, with her large eyes, straight nose, and small mouth. These pretty feminine features suggested this could be an idealized woman's face, and yet it proved to match the reconstruction surprisingly closely. The proportions of the lower face corresponded, and so did those of the forehead. Though in the portrait, the eyes were closer together and larger than in the reconstruction, and in both cases, the head was set on a solid neck, suggesting a more powerful physique than you might have expected from these delicate features. So, overall, the similarities between the portraits and the models are too close to be accidental. The artists may have started from a standard picture, but attempts were made to modify this to reflect the characteristics of the subject, what gave the face its personal qualities. Obviously, this isn't much of a sample upon which to judge an entire genre of portraiture, but the researchers are convinced that, on the whole, the artists aimed to represent their subjects as they appeared in real life, whether this was flattering to them or not. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.